So I'm Emily Thomas, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Durham University. And you're currently writing a book about the philosophy of travel. I am, yeah, it's almost finished. And the book explores various ways that philosophy and travel have interacted from the 16th, 17th century onwards. Right, so to give you a few examples, Francis Bacon, back in the end of the 16th century, came up with a new philosophy of science where he thought that rather than staying at home and sitting in an armchair in order to learn about the world, what we should be doing is going out into the world through travel and collecting all kinds of strange creatures and fossils and plants. And, and then through travel, we could bring that knowledge back home um, and from that figure out how the world really works. So I think that was one of the earliest serious engagements with philosophy and travel. But there have been lots and lots more. For example, uh, John Locke thought that if we can use travel literature to understand how the human mind works, he thought that if humans really have innate ideas, then every human being the world over would have the same ideas about morality and God. And of course, travel shows that that's not the case at all. Uh, people around the world have really different ideas. Uh, so he's using travel to argue against innate ideas. Um, it also covers things like the ethics of visiting doomed places, so places that are changing dramatically through climate change. And lots of us want to see the icebergs before they melt and see the coral reef before you know, they're destroyed by rising sea level temperatures. But the very act of visiting these places might actually hasten their demise. And, and so that becomes a moral issue. Sure, we want to see them, but maybe we shouldn't be. So is, is your philosophy of travel book then focusing more um, on the ethics of travel? It's a real exploration of travel and philosophy in general. Right? So it, it works chronologically from the very earliest intersections of travel and philosophy and then moves forward in time. Right? So it looks, for example, at um, Henry Theroux has lots to say about the notion of wilderness in his book Walden. Um, I look at the notion of maps, like what a map is, what philosophy can tell us about that. Um, and then ethics is just one of the many issues facing philosophers today. So if you were to take three things that philosophy tells us about travel, what would they be in terms of like what we should or shouldn't do when we when we travel or why we travel? That's really nice. Okay. So I think philosophy definitely tells us that travel can be a source of knowledge, right? that it can be mind expanding. Lots of philosophers have actually compared going on a philosophical journey to going on a literal journey to distant lands. And I think what they're getting at there is that we need to expand our minds, that that's a really good thing for us to do. I also think that thinking about philosophy can help us travel more mindfully. It can help us understand the cultural and ethical significance of the kind of journeys that we're going on and why we're doing them in the first place. Um, and finally, I think that philosophy can tell us unexpected things about why we travel. Right? So, for example, up until the early 18th century, people didn't visit mountains. People weren't very interested in mountains. They thought that they were ugly warts, pockmarks upon the earth. There was a sea change in the way that philosophy thought about landscapes, and that seems to have led to a massive upsurge in mountain tourism. What they originally changed their minds about was the nature of space. Right? So in the 17th century, you have a theory becoming really popular, and it's actually a theory that I will be talking about here. It, um, it was held by Isaac Newton, and it's the view that space is a real kind of thing. Right? So it's a thing that has a topology and properties of its own, and Newton identified space with God. And that meant that infinite places are associated with God, they become divine. And what you get, because Newton was so popular, is a whole succession of artists and poets and writers who then begin to talk about infinite-looking places like mountainscapes and oceanscapes as being divine. So suddenly mountains, rather than being these warts upon the earth, become cathedrals to God. 
and, and it's definitely a reaction to the way that people's conception of space has changed. Okay, and um, another topic that you're going to talk about at the festival is time. Would you be able to tell us and what your research has focused on? Uh, yeah, so I think what time is, is one of the biggest questions that philosophers can ask. It's one of the biggest questions that humans can ask. Um, and I'm just as fascinated by it as everyone else. There are different ways to work on time and philosophy. So one way is to work in contemporary metaphysics and really try and dig down uh, maybe into the science or into the philosophy and ask what time is. But what I'm really interested in is how theories were invented and developed in the history of philosophy. So I've just finished a study on absolute time, which was a theory invented in the 17th century, which says it's a kind of thing. And Newton also wants to identify absolute time with God. So again, time becomes divine. What I'm working on right now is a new book, um, and it's going to cover late 19th, early 20th century philosophy. And it's looking at the way that debates we have today Things like, does time really pass? Is there something special about the present moment? How those debates were invented and developed. And, and I hold a controversial view, which is that these debates were actually invented about 100 years ago. I don't think people were talking about that before. And I think there's something special about that period that really drove people to ask, does time flow, does time pass? And I'm interested in how they began asking those questions. I think there were a few different things that happened. One was the view that time is an unreal illusion became phenomenally popular, partly through the work of people like Kant and Hegel, but it was really picked up in the Anglo-American world. And everyone just began denying the reality of time. And so they really believed that at the fundamental level, events do not happen before or after one another. And I think there was a massive reaction to this, that a whole other group of philosophers suddenly began saying, but that's crazy. Of course, things happen before and after one another. And what's more, we feel like we're in time. And then you get this hodgepodge of science is feeding into the philosophy. So psychology is becoming really popular for the first time. I mean, it's really being developed as a discipline. There's lots of interesting work going on in physics. This is before relativity. So things like Minkowski saying that space and time should be unified as a four-dimensional space-time. There's also the biological theory of evolution, which took some time after Darwin to filter through into philosophy. In Darwin, we have scientists seeming to say, if you give time long enough, it can create new species, it can build mountains. And, and I think that philosophers really began to take this stuff on board, and they really began to think of time as a kind of powerful force. And, and then that led them to, to stress this notion that time really flows, it really passes, and, and then you start getting the debates going between the philosophers on the one hand who say time does not flow or pass and philosophers on the other hand who are saying it definitely flows and passes. The other um, subject that you've focused on has been women on metaphysics and I was wondering whether you could um, bring one or two examples of um, female philosophers that you discovered and admire and run us through their, their ideas very quickly. So up until 20 or 30 years ago people would commonly say there were no women in the history of philosophy up until maybe 1950. Like, women just didn't do philosophy, they didn't exist. And over the last 20, 30 years, there's been a huge recovery project to go back into archives and old books and say, actually, no, there were quite a lot of women floating around. And what's more, they had really cool philosophical things to say. So for example, um, the philosopher Anne Conway, she's active in the mid-17th century. She has a reply to Descartes' account of what the world is. So Descartes thought that our world is made up of bodies and minds, that these are two different kinds of substances, that that raises a big interaction problem. 
For one thing, if God, who is supposed to be a big immaterial mind, interacts with the world, how is God an immaterial being creating things like bodies? And then how are our minds interacting with our bodies? It seems like there are two interaction problems there. And Conway just wants to solve this by saying, everything that exists is fundamentally immaterial. And she gets rid of both interactions in one fell swoop. And she builds up this picture of the world full of little immaterial creatures that are all interacting with each other in different ways. Some might seem a bit more like minds, some are a bit more like bodies, but fundamentally they're all the same living thing. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.